the underlying force of the law of attraction, which is, you know, the, the, what you put out there, you receive almost like karma. But Bob Proctor talks about the law of vibration, right? So here's a way to think about the law of vibration. If I take two pianos and I have one piano here and I have another one over there and I hit a key on this piano without me hitting a key on the other piano, it will pick up the same note. It will start to resonate on the same because I hit a frequency and that will pick up that frequency. And if you look at human beings, we're energy emitting creatures. So even then to a brainwave. So if you think of what a brainwave is a neuron, when you have a thought or you learn something new, or even you're listening here, a neuron in your brain will communicate to another one. It will create this kind of wave and it'll create an energy emission so energy will come out so that's what brainwave essentially is equally us when we meet somebody we feel the energy of that person you're listening to the sales today podcast and i'm your host fred copestake on this podcast we explore how sales professionals can develop a more modern approach to selling the application of virtual and hybrid selling techniques how to create meaningful business relationships and much more and welcome to this episode of the Sales Today podcast, where I'm delighted to be joined by Aidan McCullen. Aidan, welcome. Fred, great to be with you, man. So now it's, it's really cool that you've, you've got time to come and speak to me because <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take a deep breath and do your introduction. Okay. So Aidan is principal at Edge Behavior, host of the Innovation Show. So he's another podcaster. Oh, I need to watch out non-exec director at National Broadband Island, lecturer in emerging trends in digital marketing strategy at Trinical College Dublin, member of the board of directors at Rise Global Foundation. <laughs> so, is, is, <laughs> I, I've missed anything. Oh, and author of Indisruptible, which is why we want to have a chat today. So I have actually forgot the most important bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the hardest bit's actually being a, a husband and a parent. That's the hardest part of it all. It's where all my time goes. And, oh, and quite rightly so. Quite rightly so. So a busy guy, but also your backstory is incredibly busy. Um, starts off with playing professional rugby. So can you just talk a little bit through that? Because it is relevant to the whole topic of this, which is about change. And that's where we're, we're going with the whole of this podcast. So just talk a little bit about being a pro rugby player. Yeah. So firstly, I, I wasn't that good of a pro rugby player. I was I was a hard worker. So I, I think, uh, Fred, you, you've you been a referee. You, you've seen these type of players. There's players that are really, really talented. Then there's players who are disciplined. And the role of any coach is to make the talented players disciplined. <laughs> so I... <laughs> Because some of the talent players don't aren't disciplined, they don't rise to the top. And I was just really disciplined. And I probably took the place of some guys who were far more talented than me. And I say that to say, as a as a kid, I was unremarkable. Like you would never ever go, that kid's gonna do well. I was often not picked on teams, and I was the last picked in a playground, that type of kid. So that was when I look back on the story and you can kind of connect the dots looking backwards, as Steve Jobs said, I saw that as the first transformation or the first change because somewhere in my, I got it into my head that I wanted to play because I only kind of stumbled into playing rugby because I had to in my school. And it wasn't until I was around 16 that I went, okay, I'm going to go for this. And I just put my head down, created a vision, went for it, did the work, showed up every day, and overtrained more than the other players and overtrained to the perspective of getting injured as well a lot. But that then got me ahead of people. And unfortunately, in Ireland, a lot of guys discover alcohol around <laughs> the, the teenage years, and they did to my benefit. And I, I went to the gym when they went to the bar. And as a result, I went away and I studied French and German. I studied French and German in Trinity College, where I lecture now but i part of my year the erasmus year which is this amazing year that you have in college was i was able to go and travel and i found out that a club in france had lost many many of their top players players household names at the time showing my age here now but olivier mania fabian Pelouse, rafael Ibinez, they were all like these leading french players and they played for this 
club that was a first division club called Dax. And they all left at the same time. The club was in trouble. There was no way they were able to fill all those, those positions. So I got this bright idea that I'd <laughs> find somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody and I ended up playing there. So I was, I was the youngest player in French div first division for, at the time, for, for youngest forward. And I had this amazing experience as a 20 year old. I was the only French speaker, only English speaker in the town. So I was forced to read, learn French. I was plunged into this culture of French. This, it was, there was a bull arena, you know, a bullfighting yeah, arena yeah. in the town of Dax. It was amazing. And I learned not only the culture of the French culture, but the way to play rugby. And that learning of that lesson of playing rugby, when I came back then and did my finals in college, was a breeze for me because I had lived in France and, and I did my finals of French breeze through them. And then I had a whole new skill set that I was able to apply to my rugby skills. So I'd built these capabilities that you wouldn't, I wouldn't have got had I stayed in Ireland. And I would have just learned the culture of playing that we had in Ireland at the time. And we weren't that successful back then. This was in the late 1990s. And as a result, end up getting a contract for Leinster and went on then to play for Toulouse, which was, was a team that I saw when I was in Dax back there. And I was like going, wow, I never knew rugby could be played like that. And it was like poetry in motion, amazing team to observe and watch play. And then even more amazing to go and play for them. And I had such an amazing experience there in my late twenties. And that was towards the end of my career, went back to London Irish then, and played for two years towards the end of career, mainly injured because of all that training I talked about. <laughs> and um, yeah, and, and to your point, at the end of that, then you face a real reinvention, which is what my book is about on Disruptable, is this idea of permanent reinvention that we're in this period of time where there's no more safe haven. There's no more, I'm, I've made it, I'm here, I can relax, I can rest on my laurels. We're in a time of change that is so rapid that we have to keep adding new capabilities, building new skills, new arrows in the quiver to be able to be thriving in this period of time, because those people who do that will thrive. So that's a lesson you learn early in sport because you have to retire and it's quite a young re retirement. And really what you have to do is kill off that person you used to be because clinging to it is not healthy. Clinging to it's a little bit it can be a bit sad talking to those people who cling to the shell of who they used to be. So you just let that person go, take what's useful from that being that used to be and go on and enjoy a new iteration of life. Wow. No, that, 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 that is so cool. And, and that it really is why I want to talk to you apart from the rugby thing. Um, <laughs> I, I played a year. Well, I say I went on an Erasmus thing oh, as well great. to Spain. Yeah. And I played rugby. I, I knew where the Brilliant. rugby club was before the university, which probably shouldn't. <laughs> too. it's okay now it's 20 years ago um but no that that thing you said there about there being no more safe haven and this this change this speed of change that's going on you know this is what i'm trying to get the point across to salespeople that you know this world that we're used to it's gone and it is changing at pace and that's something that you talk about isn't it it's like that the, this speed of change that's going on yeah, so the speed of change is, is really the message, it's the why behind all this, it's the why behind the work you do, because what you're really trying to do is make people aware of why there's a need to change, because there wasn't this need in the past, because we lived in a pretty steady state and business environment where the cycles of change were slower, and the cycles of change are getting quicker and quicker. One of the ways to think about that is purely how quickly technology, new technologies come to the marketplace. Be before they used to kind of follow this, it's called the S curve, this kind of slow growth where over a period of time, they slowly trickle into the marketplace. Then there's this kind of acceleration uh, growth phase, and then they start, start to peter out in the marketplace, which meant if you think about that shape of the S kind of stretched out in your mind, that gave you a nice period of time to sell that product over yeah. a period of time. But the cycles are becoming more vertical. So it's more like a, a lowercase L now <laughs> yeah, where it's yeah. coming straight down. Because if you think about something like 5G, that's just going to hit the market. It's going to be adopted as quick as possible. It's already available. 
And one of the reasons it's not out here, it's kind of like the scarcity mentality of diamonds. If you release it too quickly on the marketplace, you can't have that scarcity. They, the, the telcos still want to sell 4G yeah. and before they start bringing in 5G. So there's a selling period. So what does that mean? That means that most of the products and services we sell now will be disrupted quicker than ever before which means that we need to learn quicker what those products are, understand them, understand our customer more. And in a world that's becoming more and more digital, we need to become more and more human. So we need to connect with people. So before I, we go there, Fred, because I know this is an important part of your training, your work, just to e exemplify or to really help our audience understand the speed of change, across everything I study and through my own podcast, I read eclectically and prolifically a book every week and interview the author on that for the last almost seven years. And one of the reasons I did that was for my own personal learning. And I often think of my podcast as, as learning with witnesses. <laughs> and <laughs> the, the thing I learned from all that was many, many terms of change. And one of these terms kept showing up and our audience will be familiar with this exponential change. Oh, that's changed exponentially. The business place has changed exponentially. And if you think about that for a moment, what you will think is, oh, it means really, really fast yeah. change. And that's what I used to think. Yeah. But exponential means something entirely differently that actually catches you off guard. And it's a driving force behind so much of the change in the marketplace today. So a way to understand exponential is through a thought experiment that I discovered that I'll share with you. So Picture in your mind Wembley Stadium, or it can be Twickenham for you, Fred, because I know you, you're a rugby. <laughs> rugby About the same size, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so in a thought experiment, it's scientifically accurate, but never has been done. As you will hear, you'll be quite glad this one has never been done. So in this thought experiment, Wembley is sealed shut. It's watertight. No water can escape from it. Now you've got tickets. You were meant to give them to the client. You kept them for yourself, right? <laughs> but your client come in, came in last minute and goes, Fred, hey, have you got any tickets for the game? I, I, I'm bringing my family. You're going, oh, damn. Oh, yeah, sure. Let me get you some tickets. Get them the tickets. You give them the good pitch side tickets. Meanwhile, you're sitting right up the very top of the stadium, right at the back. You can barely see the pitch, right? So onto the pitch beforehand, as the pre-match kind of warm up, the referee conducts an experiment and they take out a water dropper you know those tincture droppers that you would drop just a drop of some type of vitamin or maybe yeah. some type of medicine and the referee is going to drop water at an exponential rate now just to make this very clear a linear rate would be one two three four five six seven an exponential rate is two four eight sixteen thirty two sixty four so for those people of a certain age, like me, that will remember this, you might remember like the Commodore 64 or the Spectrum 128K, those computers, yeah. that's the type of exponential growth of change of computer technology. So what it means is doublings, doublings in capability, okay? And exponential growth is the force behind at which the referee is going to drop water. So these drops of water, I mean, I mean, literally a drop of water from a tincture. So a minute passes, the referee goes from two to four, a minute later, eight, 16, 32. And the question I have, and I'll give you a little pause to think about this, is how many, how long do you think it would take if the referee continues to drop water at an exponential rate every minute, it will take to fill the entire stadium, remembering that it's watertight. So let you think about that for a moment. How long is it going to take to fill a full stadium, the refs dropping at an exponential rate? So one every drop, minute, two drops, four drops, every minute. Okay. okay. So Go when on. I <laughs> would ask that in a keynote or in a workshop, you'll get a wide range of answers, weeks, years, months, days. Some people will go hours. And the answer is actually 49 minutes, which is mind-blowing for a human brain to understand what the heck 49 minutes to fill this stadium so 
here's the rub with that, right? So that's difficult enough to understand. But remember that client that you gave the pitch site, <laughs> it's that poor client that's down the bottom. By the time the water covers their head, they're sitting pitch side. The stadium's only 7% full, right? But 45 minutes has elapsed, which means to fill the remaining 93% takes a mere four minutes. So you think you have time to change. You think you have time to escape from the stadium here in this instance. And you just simply don't have time. And think about it. Put yourself in that situation. You're sitting at the top of the stadium, looking down. You go, oh, it looks like poor old Jim down there is covered in water. <laughs> Didn't really like him anyway. He wasn't a great <laughs> client. Glad, glad to be rid of him. And I signed the deal beforehand. Great. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. you, you forget about that, right? So And then you go, okay, I think we should get out of here. Everybody rushes for the doors at the same time. People are being bumped out of the place. People are falling off. It's a disaster. It's, it's mayhem. It's chaos. In that moment, your brain goes into fight or flight mode. Here's what happens in fight or flight mode. In fight or flight mode, blood is diverted from your forebrain, the part of your brain that makes you intelligent, the part of your brain that feeds your neocortex. Neocortex just means the new shell, this newer part of the human brain, the reason why we're king of the planet, if you want to put us that way. And it's diverted towards our fists for fight, and our feet for flight. In those moments, we become less intelligent. Now, to put this more into a very day-to-day -day instance for all of us, think of those moments where perhaps you're giving a presentation in your company, perhaps you're going to break up with an ex girl well, now an ex-girlfriend or boyfriend, and you want to give them a piece of your mind when you're in that meeting. And then, or perhaps you're going to your boss and asking for a raise. And you have all these intentions, you've written all, all these points you're going to say in the moment, and then you go in there and you get back to your desk 20 minutes later and loads of things come back, flooding back to memory. You're kind of going, oh, I forgot to say this and I forgot to say that. The reason that happened to you is because you went into fight or flight mode and we are less intelligent in fight or flight mode. And why am I telling you all this? That is exactly what happens to organizations when they do not build capabilities before they need those capabilities until they wait for the crisis in order to make the change happen. And equally for each of us, and this is a huge driver of your work, Fred, that's what happens to anybody who is waits for a crisis in order to build new skills. Think about it. You get let go, you get made redundant, God forbid, but it does happen. And it's going to happen faster than ever before because companies are getting disrupted. Therefore, the people in those companies get disrupted. And if they have not built the capabilities before they need them, they have to go out to market. They'll take a job, often haphazardly, not thinking about it. They'll make a mistake. This will be a blip on the CV then. And it'll look like, oh, that didn't work out for me. That's because we haven't built capabilities before we need it. We haven't looked out to the marketplace before we need it because we get comfortable. And the whole drive of my work here is that we do not have that luxury anymore because the cycles of change are going much more quicker and they're all driven by technology now more increasingly because more businesses will become technological businesses. They'll become digital businesses. And once they become then, then they move into being exponential businesses. Hence, we need to build these capabilities before we need them. And the last thing I'll say on that, Fred, is for those of you who like military terms and stuff like this, there's a beautiful one, a beautiful saying I found. It's a Spartan warrior mantra. The more you bleed, the more you sweat in times of peace, the less you bleed in war. So you do the work when times are going well. Because when things are not going so well, you're not going to be as tolerant of the failures that are inevitable when you're trying something new. If you're an organization, you're not going to be tolerant of the failures that happen as you try to innovate and iterate and build new business models. So you do it when things are going well. And the cycles of things going well and being at the top of the curve are becoming less and less. Therefore, it's becoming more frequent to be up and down and up and down and up and down. 
we know sooner we got out of the pandemic than we were into inflation and mm. Ukraine and Brexit and all these types of upheavals that are just going to be so much more common in a world that's becoming more and more volatile. I just, I love the analogy. I, I can see it. And what I'm thinking in the world of sales is it's like the sort of the salesperson or me, you know, sat on the back of the stadium, got a head flask, passing it around, chatting away. You don't even notice the water. You're not seeing it fill up until suddenly you look and, oh, gosh. Then you immediately start to panic. And like I say, that's when you start acting stupid because your brain is working in that stupid way. Less intelligent, I think you said. Stupid will do for me. <laughs> And so you're now not thinking properly as the salesperson. Same is going on with your customer who is also noticing that stuff has changed. They go into this kind of panic mode. They're not thinking intelligently either. We've kind of like got dumb and dumber who are trying to figure stuff out. <laughs> and it's just not, it's not going to happen, is it? Um, and this is where I see there's huge, huge, huge potential for the salesperson who, as you say, prep early, get themselves sorted so they're not working this panic mode to then go to the customer and say, hey, look, Carl, I can help you here. I've got you. I've got you back. Yeah, I've got the life ring, whatever, whichever, keep the analogy going. But that's how I see this, this operating. Like the, um, the point there is about the, do you remember earlier when I was saying the, the more the world becomes more digital, the more we need to be more human. So yes, what I yeah. mean by there is actually we're... <laughs> So we, we all know you've been through training before as a salesperson that there's a paradox of choice, too many choices, people become blinded and et cetera, et cetera. So you have to dig behind offering more choice. It's not about more. It's actually about less. And what I mean there is if you dig into the reasons behind why somebody's coming to buy from you is there's always some human need behind it. And if you can understand those needs, and understand that the things and understanding biases is a really, really mm -hmm. valuable skill for a human, for, for a sales person in a human society. What I mean there is most people are going to go through loss aversion, which is they're more fearful of something they lose rather than something they gain. And this is why you have buyer's remorse, et cetera, et cetera. So if you understand, for example, somebody wants to buy a new car and you go, okay, well, what is the driver behind that new car? What do you need here? And they kind of go, well, you know, my kids have grown up now. They, one is into sport. One of them is into uh, science and I have to drive uh, this guy over here and this girl over here. She loves her basketball and he loves the science and I have to bring them to different places. I need two cars and we have one car. We're happy with that. We need another one. And then you, so you dig into that and you're kind of going, oh, I really want to sell that people carrier over in the corner there. But that's not the place to jump to next. The place to jump to is next is, and what, what do you need here? Do you need like a, a runaround car? Do you need like, let me understand that more. They will not be used to those type of questions because they're very human questions. And if you start to build a connection on a human level, you end up being able to sell more to that person. And even to a point, and this is really, really difficult, I know. I worked in sales for a long time. If you tell the person, I don't think this is the right time for you to buy this, because you're kind of going, oh, there goes my commission, or there goes my, my quota for the, the month, or whatever it might be, you feel like you're driving them away. But your reputation gets out there. And then they might tell someone else and kind of go, you know what? I didn't buy at the time. And that guy, geez, that guy, Aiden in there, he gave me his card, really good, really connected with him, really good guy. And there's a, I don't know if you heard about the late um, Bob Proctor, Fred, have you heard of Bob Proctor? Bob Proctor. Proctor, yeah. So he passed away recently. He was a guy who was trying to chase to get on my show for a long time. So he talked about, and I talk about this in my book, the law of vibration, right? So Bob uh, featured in the movie, The Secret, that famous book, the Rhonda Byrne book, The Secret, about the law of attraction, etc. But he said there's a part of the law of attraction that is so often overlooked, and I'm a huge believer in this. So the law of attraction, the underlying force of the law of attraction, which is, you know, the, the, what you put out there, you receive almost like karma. 
but Bob Proctor talks about the law of vibration, right? So here's a way to think about the law of vibration. If I take two pianos and I have one piano here and I have another one over there and I hit a key on this piano without me hitting a key on the other piano, it will pick up the same note. It will start to resonate on the same because I hit a frequency and that will pick up that frequency. And if you look at human beings, we're energy emitting creatures. So even then to a brainwave. So if you think of what a brainwave is a neuron, when you have a thought or you learn something new, or even you're listening here, a neuron in your brain will communicate to another one. It'll create this kind of wave and it'll create an energy emission. So energy will come out. So that's what brainwave essentially is. Equally us, when we meet somebody, we feel the energy off that person. And this isn't mumbo jumbo. I know it <laughs> might sound like it is uh, uh, more and more. We're learning this type of stuff. So even we use the language of vibration. So that coffee shop, oh, I really like the vibe in that place. You know what? The great energy in that place. Oh, I love, I love Fred show. I love the energy of the guy. And you'll go, I really connect with him. Mm. What you're talking about there is vibration. And what law, law of vibration dictates is you connect on the same energy. So it's almost like a radio station. So if I tune into a certain level, which might be positivity, I'm going to connect with things that are going to be more positive. So if you can connect with the customer on a level, they're going to be open to your message. You know what it's like yourself. If you smell you're being sell, sold to without <laughs> that connection first happening, you're just kind of going, you know what? They're not even listening to me. It's like, I don't know, Fred, Fred, do you remember Wayne's World? Do you remember that show, Wayne's World, years ago? Yeah, yeah. I don't remember they go into the, to the DJ and the DJ is like, he's like, kind of go, yeah, tell me about Wayne's World, Wayne's World, party time, all this stuff. And they're like, the DJ's not listening. And they start to go, yeah, it's going to be this great event. You know, we're going to raise money for charity. And then they look, and he's not looking. He's like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he's looking around his studio, yeah. not, not at all listening to them. And they're like, oh, we could say anything on your show and you wouldn't. And then they go on to say a, a series of words that I won't use in case there's children listening to today, <laughs> but check it out on, on YouTube if you want to check out that clip. But that is often what it's like for their customer. If they don't feel A, you're listening to them and B, you're connecting with them because the connection thing is creating a customer that's going to be a repeat customer. And the law of vibration, I highly, highly, highly recommend checking that out it's a game changer when you start because you start to spot it and i'm such a believer in that fred that i was telling one of my kids about this and when he was younger because he was talking about um uh, you know how he, he this is when he was only eight he's like going to you know get on with some other people etc and i was telling him about this and he and he's big into batman at the time and he, he was big into bats as a result of being into batman he's like kind of going well it's, that sounds like echolocation i was like i know go on and he's like, well, bats put out this signal and it bounces off things and it comes back to them. I was like, it's exactly what it is, son. So he understood karma in that moment, which is which is great. But I just think that those kind of little mental models, those kind of little cheats, cheat sheets, if you want to think about them yeah. for life, are useful in every aspect of life because we're always selling in everything that we do. Oh, don't start me on the sales skills and life skills. <laughs> well, no, that, I mean, I do some stuff with the local university as well around precisely that. Again, Brilliant. different story. But um, so just thinking about that and how we can start to resonate, you know, get on the same wavelength as customers, we can then do quite deliberate things to do this. And, and this isn't being manipulative. I no. It, this is about actually having other people's... Um, kind of best best intention at your heart uh, sorry not running around you know, you've got that their best outcomes that's what you're trying to do so you're going to very deliberately try to get onto that same wavelength i like i'm a huge believer in this fred where if if you're pure in your intentions the 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 money just follows like i i really do believe that like the if you if you do things in a in a honest authentic way of service where it's like going look i i have this product i believe in it i i, I think it's very difficult to sell a product you don't believe in yeah. really do i think it's it's that that feels weird that feels forced and there's a reason because it's not connecting with you and yeah. i think that you know when if you're in that situation think about it because yeah. 
selling is a skill and authentic selling is an even rarer skill. And if you can actually get behind the product that you're selling, if you're a user and a believer in it and you believe it's doing the right thing. And this is, you know, this goes to leadership of companies as well. This is why you don't treat a sales department like a, a silo in your organization. Mm -hmm. They are they need to know the workings of the product. They need to be connected to marketing. Mar By the way, marketing is just meaning. Marketing is translating the meaning for the customer. So that message sent equals message received. A great example of that is um, the iPod. Again, I'm displaying my age here. When the iPod first came out. I'm good with all this. I'm getting every single reference. <laughs> we're connected. Uh, low vibration, Fred. So oh, we would back all the same way. So actually, the iPod's a great one from, from a couple of perspectives. From, one's from sales, one's from marketing, and the other one is exponential. So Apple understood exponential change. And one of the reasons I wanted to share exponential change is it is getting ahead of where the marketplace is going. Everything Go, follows a, a law called Moore's Law. And Moore's Law was named after the Intel founder, Gordon Moore. And what he observed was every 18 months or so, 12 to 18 months, technology halved in size, halved in price, and doubled in power. So this is why the same computer that sent Apollo to the moon, supposedly for those conspiracy theorists out there. <laughs> had the same... You're opening so many potential <laughs> rabbit holes in this. We could do a whole series. <laughs> Has the same power as a PlayStation console. So this, and by the way, the computer back there was the size of a building, like a massive room. It was held in a massive, massive building. And now the computer in your phone, actually a modern toaster, that's a connected toaster would have the same power today. Everything comes down in size, doubles in power. And that's so much so that we're coming to a point where Moore's law is becoming so small because the, the sensors in the phones can't get any smaller. So what they're doing now is, for example, outsourcing that. So if you use Siri, for example, on your iPhone, it's in the cloud now. So the sensors aren't even needed on the phone anymore. So this is how they're getting beyond these kind of challenges. But Apple understood this with the iPod. So by understanding standing exponential change they wanted to be able to store a thousand songs in your pocket and if for anybody who remembers at the time that was the mantra everybody across apple everybody else who could created mp3 players were talking about oh it's a gigabyte of ram you know all this and that's gobbledygook for people at the time even if i was to ask you you don't know how much a gig of ram you know it's kind of small today but that was a lot back then apple did it differently. They spoke in the language of the customer. It's a thousand songs in your pocket. That makes total sense. What? A thousand songs in my pocket? Great. So then they went, okay, we don't yet have the capability to hold a thousand songs on a, on a, a storage device. But understanding Moore's law, you know, somebody's going to solve that very soon. So what do you do? Keep an eye on the patent database. Along comes Toshiba. They released this patent for a storage device that fits exactly to the size Apple want. But in the meantime, knowing that somebody was going to solve that, they worked away on the design, what it would look like, what the advertising would like. And it's like there's an old quote by Wayne Gretzky, the hockey player, Canadian hockey player. And he was asked by a journalist, how are you such a good player? And he goes, I skate to where the puck is going, not where it is today. And that is useful for any kind of R&D team or innovation team. But equally, by understanding that, you translate it into meaning that means something to the customer as well. That's exponential power. But that's also understanding what marketing is. By understanding that, then the sales team understand you're going to be a better sales team. And one of the big tragedies that happens in organizations is the silo effect that happens across organizations, not communicating with each other, not understanding why we do something. Because you know yourself, it's way easier to deliver on something, to sell it when you understand the workings behind it. And that takes a bit of deliberate work by you to understand it, to be able to ask questions, to probe, to look for extra training, all those things. They pay massive dividends. Well, so much, so much to talk about. <laughs> oh, no, 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 talk about to take away from this. 
So I'm thinking, you know, someone who's listening to this is going, this is great. You know, you kind of make him my head hurt a little bit, <laughs> <laughs> which is good because that's the point. We want it to. It's the yeah, wake yeah. up, the stadium's filling. Yeah. <laughs> We're now one row below you. And when it doubles again, <laughs> you know, it's that's way the above. problem. Yeah. Yeah. So just a couple of these things. So when we, you know, we talk about being more human, we talk about resonating. So for me, this is about talking to them about them. Now, that's the easiest way to get yes. someone else's wave off, isn't it? Not to rock up and go, hey, look, talk about me. And then let's hope you kind of do <laughs> sink into me. It's like, what are they interested in? Well, themselves, more likely. So talk about them um, to them. Do it in simple language that they're, they're, they're going to get. So don't kind of come off this, this weird professional thing that people do, which kind of makes them just sound weird. No, thousand songs in your pocket equivalent. Um, and look and look to collaborate it's like well okay i've got this you've got the storage i've got the funky design let's get together on this and we're going to be cooking the gas but and that's what i talk about is the collaborative selling even if we just start to do just or if we start to do those things that's how we're going to start to, to future proof ourselves and make sure you know that that we're not going to get negatively affected get disrupted too badly <laughs> Absolutely. I guess. I mean, I'm trying to, trying to translate that into someone who's listening. That'd be ways, ways forward, I guess. Yeah. And, and all I'd say for people listening is, is don't, I mean, don't be afraid from any of this. The, the, you got to lean into it by resisting. If, if you resist your, your receptors for information shut down, because you, by resisting, you're essentially being fearful. And when you're fearful, you're in that fight or flight mode. You can't learn in that mode. So and the reason why you do this when things are going well is because your brainwave space is different. You're in a different kind of headspace. That's what we even use language like this all mm -hmm. the time. So you're going to be more receiving of receptive to the information that you're listening to. It's going to seep into the brain in different ways. You don't feel you need to deliver on it because there's no urgent requirement to do so. So you absorb it on your own terms at your own speed. The way to start is listening to shows like this taking courses that are achievable, going to your HR or L&D team, asking for extra learning or extra coaching opportunities, small nudges for yourself. If you are working for yourself, take a course on Coursera. There's loads of stuff out there. Watch YouTube videos, watch Fred's show. There's tons of material around the place. And we need to be deliberate about learning because innovation and learning go hand in hand. They're this we have to learn today to be ahead of the changes that are coming tomorrow. Oh, definitely watch my show, subscribe below, <laughs> all that sort of stuff. Click the buttons, reviews, all the, all, all the good things, but listen to your show too. You said you're, you're interviewing somebody a week to talk about this stuff and, and really focusing on innovation, new things. Yeah. Um, so we can pop a link to that in. Um, so the innovation show, the book, just remind us, title. So Undisruptible, A Mindset and Permanent Reinvention. And that's on Amazon or anywhere you buy books. Cool. And best place to um, best place to contact you? Yeah, LinkedIn is good. Yeah, yeah I, I release a weekly article on all this stuff on LinkedIn called The Thursday Thought every Thursday. And the innovation show dot IO. And the reason it's dot IO is IO is input output. And the way I think of it is the input is all these books and the outputs, the show as a result. It was the only, it was the only domain available really, wasn't it? <laughs> 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 but, but that's the way your brain works is that you could turn it again. Right. This is no I, reframe. I yeah. Uh, re, re, uh, again, another massive topic we could go down, but again, I know you, you are, you are you're a bit tired of time joke, joking apart. So innovation show, undisruptible book, connecting with you on LinkedIn mentioning that you know you, you heard us having a conversation um wow <laughs> thank you so much for for coming along uh, and, and talking about all this stuff it, it is one of those episodes that could go on and on <laughs> <laughs> you've been listening to the sales today podcast with me your host fred copestake if you like what you've heard why not subscribe so you know when the latest episodes become available take a look at my youtube channel all episodes are available there along with extra material all about modern selling. Connect with me on LinkedIn, where I'll share more information around collaborative selling, all part of my mission around having good people doing good things in a good way.